Are we live? We're live. I believe we are. This is amazing. Hi, I'm Emily Best. I'm the founder and CEO of Seed and Spark, and it is my incredible pleasure to be sitting in a Brady Bunch uh, array with some of the smartest people I know. Um, Sheena Allen from uh, Capway, Isa Watson from Squad, and Franklin Leonard from The Blacklist, and Sahil, if you're out there, you're late. Uh, <laughs> although I have to say in this era, I feel like somebody will be like, there's an outage, can't be there. And because everything is different now. Um, the whole purpose of this panel um, was really that uh, what I have been doing to stay grounded and motivated is calling up all the really smart people I know and asking them how they're doing <laughs> and what they're thinking about. Um, and that's really where this started, but also, all of you are managing this crisis incredibly. There he is. Hello. <laughs> What's up? How's it going? Good. How are you? Um, so, uh, and Sahil from Gumroad. Uh, what I was saying is, this is this was my pleasure to convene these people who are just smart people managing this incredibly, and um, really wanting to dive into. What is keeping you motivated? What are some things maybe you're willing to admit are gonna be different that are hard to admit? Um, and dig in from there. So we, we asked um, this crowd who's joining us the questions um, and they can post additional questions and live comments. Oh look, it's already happening and it's already moving too fast. Um, uh, and this is, um, we asked our community um, what they felt like they really needed right now and uh, and what if they were being brave, might they admit won't exist? So I actually just want to start with this first question. How are you? Uh -huh. Sheena, how are you? I used to think I was an introvert. Um, apparently I'm not, because apparently I am ready to go back outside. I am ready for outside to open back up. I will say, I. I do feel that I've gotten a lot done while being in the house. Um, but yeah, I'm I'm ready to go back outside. So I'm until though mentally, I'm better than I thought I would be four weeks in. Um, but yeah, I can't I mean honestly I can't complain. I, I, we've been executing a lot, but it's it's time to I wanna hug people. I don't really I'm not really a hugger. <laughs> but yeah. <laughs> you are not alone. I would say like 15% of our responses of what do you feel like you need right now was a hug. Yeah. Franklin, how are you? Um, I think I'm very lucky. I think uh, me and, and my family and my close friends are all safe and healthy. Um, I don't have children, which seems to be the sort of primary dividing line between uh, how one deals with being locked at home. Um, and I think that I am very much a homebody to begin with. So this is, and I've been traveling nonstop like for four years because of work. So being forced to sleep in my own bed for a consecutive month for the first time in five years has been kind of a joy. Um, I also have an amazing fiance who's an incredible cook. Like I'm, I'm doing very well with the reality that we find ourselves in, which frankly, on some level makes it even more surreal. Um, and then I also sort of weirdly built my business to, to focus on the one thing that people can do right now in Hollywood, which is read scripts and develop material. So, you know, it's, it's a strange thing to say, and I think it's important that I acknowledge how lucky I am, but I'm doing pretty well for now. I mean, I think this is really interesting. It's like there are there are parts of this that are terrible and there are parts of this that are wonderful. I'm definitely feeling the same way. This is the first time in eight years I haven't taken a trip in yeah. six weeks. Sorry, it's the first time in eight years I haven't taken at least three trips in six weeks, um, yeah. other than immediately after having my babies. Um, although, as a person locked at home with two toddlers, I could use some trips right now. <laughs> um, Sahil, how are you? I'm doing okay. Also childless. Uh, so that I think, yeah, I agree with Franklin. That sort of seems to be a lot of my friends are struggling uh, with their kids. Uh, and Gumroad has sort of, yeah, it's been sort of a boon. Uh, just, you know, we help people make money at home, uh, selling products uh, to other people, staring at their computers, of which many people are doing more of that. So business-wise, it's good. Personally, uh, I, yeah, I'm sort of slowly, I feel like slowly losing my mind. 
very slowly though. It's weird. It's like boiling a frog. So I feel sane, but I can sort of like feel myself sort of like dipping a little bit. Yeah. How does that manifest? Uh, I think it hurts. Like my ability to focus is definitely taking a big hit. Uh, and I feel like I'm normally pretty good about just like staying focused and deep work, I guess they call it right. And uh, that's harder for me now. Like I can't really go, I don't know, six hours straight staring at a computer building stuff, which is what I used to be able to do. Yeah. Um, and then also the team, like the sort of like, there's just more stuff you got to do to make sure that people are engaged, social. Like we, you know, we're, we've been a di distributed team since 2015, which in some ways it has been really great for us because, you know, in this new environment, we haven't had to react a ton, but it also just, yeah, there's, there's a lot of social infrastructure that we don't have that maybe like hurts hurts now, right? When people can go on Slack and like have all these social conversations and things yeah. like that. I was thinking recently about how much less energy I have overall for the things that really matter to me, um, like creativity and like, uh, um, you know, like sort of caretaking in a certain way. And part of it is just because like the oppression of the information coming at me, because we're all on our computers all the time, you sort of, it's really hard to shut it off and I have no discipline around that. Um, and also my stepdad listens to MFNBC at level 11 all day long. <laughs> um, and uh, I'm finding that of course the team needs a ton more emotional energy and investment um, because of exactly what you're talking about. And so, Finding resource is really challenging. Again, especially with, I'm gonna. I'm just gonna keep. I'm just gonna keep making myself feel good about being the only one who can really complain about the babies. I guess. Um, um, Isa, how about you? How are you? Overall, I'm well and can't complain. I would say that this has been kind of an up and down journey, though, and I would be lying to myself if I didn't admit that. Um, I think just as a founder, you know, we've been kind of cornered into making a lot of decisions very quickly. Um, decisions that maybe we didn't feel ready to make or you know, maybe we didn't feel like it was like on brand or whatever, but we've had to figure out a lot of stuff very quickly or even financing. Do I apply for PPP? Do I not? Like, do I raise money? Do I not? Like all that jazz and everyone has an opinion. Twitter is like the place where everyone has an opinion. So you, you just try to, <laughs> you know, and I found that, you know, I found that in this period, not that I'm like unkind or anything like that, but I found that I've been able, I've been a little bit more moody. Like on, on in some, literally in, in, within a day, like one hour, I'm like, you know, this isn't too bad. Like, you know, this is great. Like, let's pump for it. And then a few hours later, I'm like, man, this sucks. <laughs> and so, um, you know, that just vacillation of what it's like to be in a founder's body like every day um, has definitely kind of a little bit more amplified um, in this period. And personally, I'm at home in North Carolina uh, with my family. Um, it's been doing wine, doing wine tastings. I see doing wine tastings. We did a wine tasting last night that, you know, the family loved. I'm, I'm obsessed with French wine right now. So it's like please where my me. spare energy is going. Please send me your recommendations. Yes. Uh, because in this house, they only drink California Cabernet, which is not my jam. Uh, <laughs> because it tastes like jam. Um, okay. So all of you have companies. You've had to make some very quick decisions, although Sahil, I would say maybe you've just had to do more of what you're already doing faster. Um, can you tell me, like, what is the one thing that you have admitted to yourself, whether publicly or privately, that you thought this is the way the world is going to fundamentally change or this is a thing that's going to happen really fast that drove some of your decision making? I can give you an example, right? So May, uh, I think uh, March 6th is when South by Southwest announced their official cancellation. And like March 3rd or 4th, the team and I sat down and we were like, we need to think right now about what, about what happens if this gets really bad and it's really real. And the team went, film production shut down, festival shut down, uh, basically like there's no product in the market next year. We have, you know, like they just like ran through this list of shit that was going to happen. And everybody was sort of teetering on the edge of, and we just looked at that and went, we have no more revenue overnight. We have no more revenue. We're a crowdfunding platform for films, right? We do our work through in-person events at film festivals. We have no more revenue overnight. Um, and I think this, to me, that was the scariest thing to look at and say like, literally next month, we're going to have $0, pretty much $0 come in. 
Yeah. What do we do? I think the challenge for us was um, well, we're, we're not as much in person. We're of course so Capway is a a digital platform for um, financial inclusion. The core of what we do is mobile banking. Um, of course, there's some other comprehensive financial services that we do. The two biggest thing that things that changed for us though was one um, at the gate. I canceled every single thing on our calendar for the rest of 2020. Like, you know, people are like, oh, we're going back in like July or August or September. I'm like, if it's a conference or something of that nature, like scratch it off. Um, I did have to lay some people off, which was extremely hard to do. Um, and I, I did that after I actually came, we'll set up, at the time we were still going back and forth to the office. Um, this is right before Atlanta shut down. And I literally was like, if I cut my own salary, how can I still like try to keep people on? Or if I, you know, cut their salary. I mean, it was like every possible twist and turn I was trying to make to not lay people off. Mm -hmm. um, Cause I mean, some people on my team, like they just got married or they just had kids mm -hmm. and it's like, okay, I don't have kids. I'm not married. You know, I'm super frugal. So I've saved money. So like my first thought, which is like most of us who are founders, how do I cut my money and keep somebody else? And even after all of that, it was still when you run the bank, you have processing fees. You got to stay on top of regulatory. You got, I mean, so much that comes out that in order to keep the company afloat, you have to make the hard decisions of, you know, sometimes letting other people go. So that was a big decision. And then the third thing, I know I said too, the third thing for us was with our, so we had a, a schedule of things that was launching this year. So like you know, we just announced our virtual financial literacy, which was coming before this happened. Um, but something else that we were we were actually going to launch later this year, if not next year, was the ability for people who were unbanked to get money faster, faster than you would at like a Western Union or a MoneyGram. Um, these are people who are in banking deserts, internet deserts. The you know the grandmother who has a smartphone, but she only plays like Candy Crush, and she's never going to download Cash App. Um, and so we had to like rearrange even like product launches, which went into like the financial piece of the you know it's, it was. It's been uh, it's been interesting of uh, trying to make the adjustments, honestly, and it's trying to make it at the, literally at the drop of a dime. Yep. We cut salaries across the board thirty percent to keep everyone. Um, I like I surveyed the whole team of like, here's what I can do: I can reduce the size of the team, or I can reduce literally everyone's salaries by a lot. And they all wanted to keep everyone over reducing, over keeping money. Um, but everybody's had to make this trade off. I have a friend who across the board just made everybody make $15 an hour overnight executives manufacturing. He works in manufacturing overnight, right? Like these are the, and, and like, you don't know if you're right. <laughs> we don't know what the right decision is. Franklin, what about you? What would you admit just isn't going to exist anymore? I mean, I think we have to have a serious conversation about the existence of the theatrical film experience. Like, I just don't know when that returns. You know, you can reopen a state, you know, Ryan Kemp wants to reopen Georgia, but if there's not new movies playing in the theaters, does it matter if the theater's open? And what percentage of the theaters have to be open before a studio would even consider putting a, a movie that they've spent a lot of money to make in that theater? And if that movie's in the theater, how many of us, even if we're excited for it, are going to pay to go sit in a room with a bunch of people that we don't know uh, to watch that movie. And if we do that and somebody coughs halfway through the movie, how many of us are getting up and leaving and saying, I guess I'll find out what, how Bond ends on streaming. So I think that that, I think those changes were already happening in the industry. I think this moment, you know, is accelerating those changes in a way that frankly, I don't know that anybody can anticipate yet. Um, and I think that's going to be the real question. And I think that the, the thing that the industry is struggling most with right now is that there's not a lot of things that we can know about what things look like after this is over. And so much of building business models around what we do requires operating and not knowing, but we have even less inputs now than we did before. Um, and so I think that, look, there's gonna be an instinct for sort of legacy companies to really try to hold on to power and force the thing to look similar to the way that it did. Yep. And there's going to be a large number of companies, probably led by Netflix, but, you know, followed by Apple and Hulu and a lot of these other companies that are going to use this. They're going to try to seize this moment yeah. and further accelerate, accelerate the transitions that were happening, um, you know, 
there's there's a reason Netflix just took out a billion dollars in debt, and it's not because they're not trying to continue to to do better. So I, I think it's going to look. I, the one thing that I know to be true, though, is that it's going to be an interesting time for the film and, and television industry, if only because human race will need to process, heal, metabolize from everything we just lived through. And a significant part of how we're going to do that is with narrative and with narratives that can be shared worldwide. What the business models behind those narratives look like, I don't know. Um, and whether these things are explicitly about what we live through, I think they probably won't be. But I think that there's going to be a massive opportunity for artists to tell stories uh, and artists from sort of non-traditional backgrounds to tell stories. Um, and I'm excited to see them, but I don't think anybody knows what that's going to look like. And anybody who claims to know, I have great skepticism about just by instinct. Yep. I do have a quick question for Hollywood. Uh, well, thank you, Hollywood. So has all yeah. production stop like on every single type of movie and show in general like you said has it all stop or are there still like people filming like you know shows? There, are, there are productions in as i understand it south korea and iceland at the moment and i believe sweden and denmark just reopened to production as well other than that uh the only thing that exists production wise is stuff like the saturday night live cast doing the at home production uh, and I guess Parks and Rec is doing a scripted version uh, of their show uh, as a benefit uh, that will be all of the uh, the Pawnee crowd at home during the pandemic, which I'm very excited for. Um, and animation is happening, thanks to the folks in the live comments, because you don't need to be outside for that. Uh -huh. yeah. I, I will also say, so I had an interesting conversation with a theatrical an exhibitor recently who is planning to reopen tentatively in July, where allowed with extraordinary measures um, that reduce all points of contact and, you know, fumigate the theater in between things and, um, and, and says they're still anticipating only 20% uh, sort of return. Um, and uh, he said something that was very interesting to me that's been ringing around my head, which is that actually all of us in distribution and exhibition, our responsibility is to the investors in the films. And I had never heard anybody <laughs> say that to me before. Um, and that was the piece where I was like, oh, if that's really the responsibility, then all the business model is going to have to change. Because I don't know if you guys saw China reopen theaters and close them one week later yeah. uh, because there was an outbreak. And the fact is, it didn't even matter if the outbreak was related to the theaters. If you are in the first wave of businesses to reopen and there's a spike, you're going to be in the first wave of businesses to get shut down again. Exactly. Like it doesn't matter if it was your fault or not, or how many precautions you took. Um, they're going to be like, well, it's the theaters. Just like, yeah. Anyway, um, I said you have pivoted an in-person meeting business to a can we please still make friends business? And I'm not kidding. Like I, I contacted I said the second they talked about the pivot for squad because the thing that somebody asked me about film festival shutting down is where are some of these people going to go to make friends? And I wept. Mm -hmm. And then you built it. Can you talk to us about like, how, how did you, how did you make that leap and how did you do it so fast? So the thing that we are, uns that I'm still uncertain of is what IRL, this in real life connection looks like in the future. Um, even once we have the vaccine for COVID, the fact that we've lived through this trauma of like, wow, something can just kind of appear out of nowhere and take us, take down like whole entire countries. Like that's something that people, that will be in people's memories. And so Squad was all, Squad was built in response to what I call the loneliness epidemic in the millennial Gen Z generation. We're three times more lonely um, than our parents' generations. And if you look at the data, it has a lot to do with our increased use of social media. Um, and with social media, with like the perfection and the curation of people's lives, comparing our messy lives in real life to, to that, um, perfection has just been a bit hard and has, you know, caused a lot of loneliness. And so what Squad did is, you know, as opposed to facilitating social media-like interactions, we said, let's get people together who live in the same neighborhood. And um, we'll, if you are a member of Squad or on the app, you would get a squad created for you of three to four people each week. And the app would facilitate you grabbing coffee, drinks, dinner, or lunch nearby. Um, so if you were in Soho, New York, you know, adjacent neighborhood, et cetera. And so this hit. 
And I would say at the end of February, we were like, okay, let's just see what happens. Maybe it'll be like a few weeks. Um, and then, you know, literally week by week that turned into day by day, it became much clearer that, okay, um, we have to transition things to online. Like it's not gonna, it's not safe for our users. Um, and so what we did is we transitioned to, uh, you know, instead of meeting people in person near you, we broke down the location barriers. So now you can actually join people in your squad from like all around the world. Um, and then what we also did is we turned them to virtual. So virtual drinks, virtual lunch, dinner, et cetera. The thing I'll say though, Emily, that was really interesting is that that was a scary decision to make. And quite frankly, we had no video integration, no, none of that. And we had to, we built all of that in a week. Um, and it was, it was a pretty dramatic and drastic move, but I was like, I literally have to be bold and move fast. Um, or I'm going to like have a slow death. You know, those were kind of like, you know, my two options. And, and the, the other thing I'll say is that, um, we have grown at a rate that's 5x, 6x faster than we were growing pre-pandemic. I think on the sole base that people are dying without real human connection. And so they're like, you know, who are you talking to? You're literally talking to the people on the phone and FaceTiming with people you already know. You're not meeting new people. Um, and so Squad became, you know, a platform that people started to use to do that. And so we... I, TBD on kind of how everything returns to normalcy. I don't think we'll ever get back to normalcy, but TBD on what, you know, that looks like. But our biggest, biggest, you know, thing that we're trying to achieve is how do we help people make genuine connections um, with people that they get along with? It's incredible. I, I'm going to send you, so I have the event right responses from everybody who signed the 100 and I don't know, 80 people or something who signed up for this. And one of the questions we asked is what do you need most right now? 20% of the responses are community. About 15% are a hug, which you can't do virtually. Unfortunately, there's no app to replace that. Um, but, but really, I mean, we have, we have some good user data of course to support your thesis. Yeah. Um, Sahil, how about you? Like, have, have things shifted for you or how have you had to shift? I mean, I know you said it's, even though you're already remote, this is really a tax on you. Yeah, I mean, I think the when in 2015, we did a big round of layoffs from 20 people to five uh, when we when we were not able to raise this, a certain. So that was sort of like a, a one person pandemic or something like a crisis for the company. And so a lot of those decisions, you know, were kind of we, we, we haven't had to do now. You know, a lot of the, a lot of these decisions that other companies are doing, we kind of did back then. I mean, I think one of the big responsibilities we have is to share like a lot of what we've learned from doing things like that. Um, I think this is a time where a lot of people are making really fast decisions with incomplete information and you have to make them fast. I think a, a decision has a certain cost that's sort of relatively fixed over time, but the longer you wait, sort of like the, the cost of not making that decision is rising exponentially. You see this with sort of like how long it takes for different states to enact quarantine, shelter in place, et cetera. And so I think people have a responsibility to make decisions really quickly. They have to do it sort of just by nature with less information. No one really knows a lot of the like basic things about this virus too early. We don't know, like it's impossible to know what the long-term real effects are. People are just guessing at this point with some, you know, we'll see what, what ends up being true, uh, but it will take time. Um, and so I think it, it's sort of our responsibility to make a lot of these decisions fast and then share, like share the learnings. I think no one, I think Franklin is totally correct. Like we don't know what like the future of social entertainment looks like five years from now, 10 years from now. Um, my, my guess is you don't walk into a theater, buy expensive popcorn, sit in a room with a bunch of people. Like it's going to look different than that. Um, but the only way we find out what that looks like is a bunch of people trying things. A lot of those things don't work. A few of those things do work. And then we sit, tell people, Hey, by the way, we did this thing. Um, like, you know, you can do this too, you know, other independent theater, et cetera. And so I think it's just like any sort of like any learning process that a system goes through. I think it requires a bunch of people to try stuff and then report back on their learnings. Um, and I, I don't think this is the time for, for folks to grow like crazy necessarily, or like make a ton of money if you're in that position to like the way we think about it is like, we just want to, we would, you know, this is not, this is not a time to like increase income inequality, right? Like this, that's not our goal here. Like we can worry about like building a great business, like to next year, next year after, but right now we just want to stay alive. And then anything we can do on the top line um, to sort of like give back or make features uh, free or like hire folks that have been laid off so that we can build things faster for our creators, like really kind of like keep that, um, you know, keep, keep that sort of minimal uh, 
um, there's, there's no reason I think to do anything else. So, so yeah, that's kind of, those are my sort of like early thoughts. I and mean, I think strategically, like we, we sort of are tangential to the film space. We do a lot of stuff with helping filmmakers, not only sell documentaries, but a lot of educational content, which is where we've seen the biggest rise um, is in people teaching other people, which is sort of a, another, a second degree effect of this is, you know, is all the people coming into the industry, right? From schools and things like that, that's all gonna change and look very different. Um, and so we're sort of like accelerating that part of the product roadmap of like helping people teach courses and classes on Gumroad. Um, you know, instead of doing that two years from now or whatever, we're, we're sort of trying to do that as soon as, as soon as we can, ideally before the September sort of, you know, when schools start to reopen, because I assume a lot of these schools are just not gonna reopen or they're gonna need solutions that they can sort of take advantage of online, virtually, et cetera. Amazing. Yeah, I actually, there was something that came up a lot in the responses we got from the folks who signed up for this session, which is what they feel like they need most right now is clarity. And I, I, I really, I feel that I would also like it. That's why I'm having conversations like this, but you all have made decisions in the absence of clarity. And I'd like to hear a little bit about like, how do you get to the moment where you're like, just fucking do it. I think for me, the one thing I always say is that I cannot, there's a, there's a finite amount of energy that I have. Like that's, it's just a fact. And the more I stress about things that I can't control, the more I'm draining energy from that bucket that I really need to be devoting to the things that are you driving my productivity. And so I think that I have taken, literally I've stopped in days and said, just, all right, Isa, just chill out. You're not going to have clarity here and you're going to have to be comfortable with the fact that, you know, there's so much ambiguity and uncertainty about the future and you can't control it. You just have to do the best that you can. And I think that, you know, that's a little bit of a personal kind of pep talk that I give myself just to make sure that I can continue to chart forward um, in the in these, you know, arena of uncertainty. But the one thing I'll say about, you know, the just do it is there is no right answer. Like anytime I've made a quick decision, I'm like, just just do it. I just, I kind of woke up and it was a feeling. It wasn't a board meeting that there was a unanimous agreement. There wasn't like a survey that was, you know, generated. Sometimes you just have to go from the gut and trust that you'll get the respective feedback because doing something is a lot better than not doing anything and not getting that feedback. And so, you know, when we first quietly launched this four weeks ago, we were just doing it to get that feedback and then we went super hard on it like just this week. And so um, I think that it's just kind of going with your gut and just also recognizing and taking care of yourself mentally, but recognizing that so much of this we can't control and we just have to get comfortable, like being uncomfortable. Gut is such an interesting thing, right? Because your, your gut is actually the sum of all your experience informed by the information you're taking in. And so it really matters where you're taking in information. Like where are you, where are you going to reliably inform your intuition? Who do you, who or where do you go? I'm assuming Twitter is probably not the answer. But maybe <laughs> for, for me, I go to my users and I even look at kind of how they're messaging and the app things that they're, you know, things that are top of mind, I talk to them. You know, I meet with squad users every single week, multiple times a week. And so I think that I am the closest to what I'm doing than anyone else on the planet. And so at the end of the day, we also have to trust the fact that we know what's up. You know, our investors have like hundreds of companies that they've invested in, but they have a 30,000 foot view. Mm -hmm. You know, our, our mothers know well, but they have their view in, in their generation. So. I think that um, for me, it's, it's about users, but, and also quite frankly, Twitter stresses me out sometimes. I'm not gonna lie. Like I'm retweeting people right now who are tweeting me, but I mean, sometimes I have to just turn it off for a day. It's too stressful, you know? Franklin, I'm really curious because I think, I, you may not think of this of yourself, but I think you are widely regarded as just such a formidable mind and so I think people go to you when they're looking to inform themselves. So where do you go when you're looking to inform yourself? I mean, look, I, I think that my team, honestly, 
like I, the, the one skill that I think I have, and it's sort of, I built a whole company in support of that skill, but I think it also is applied to how I've existed as a manager is that I hire very well. Um, and I try to create a dynamic within my team where their job is to tell me when I'm wrong, right? And so like, there is no punishment, there's no expectation of frustration from me. If you say, Franklin, I think you're wrong, I disagree, don't do this. Uh, there would be, and it's a fireable offense, if I make a decision to then say, I knew you shouldn't have done that, if I can then say, well, why didn't you say anything? Right. And at the end of the day, I still may make a decision that's different from what you're saying I should do, but it is literally your job to make the most compelling case for your point of view. And often I will take the, I will sort of play devil's advocate because I'm just testing how thorough your arguments are, not because I agree with the opposite of it. And I think my natural instinct, I think I have a naturally argumentative personality. And I think that what I look for is who are the smartest people that I can talk to? to debate these things, whether or not I already agree with them or not. Like, let's just tease these things out as aggressively as possible. Yeah. Basically, separate from me participating in one side of the debate, I try to sort of also take a step outside of my own body and watch it, suck up all the information I can about as many of these debates as possible, and then make a gut move based on everything I've gathered by having these deep, aggressively argumentative, but you know, no, not personal debates about the issues at hand. It's worked for me so far. It, it's not always going to work for me, but I think that like, you can't really do better than asking smart people to disagree with you and make compelling arguments against whatever your instinct is. Um, and then you just, you know, you, you, you roll the dice and hope it works out well. And sometimes it doesn't. And then you double back and, and have, that, have those conversations again about, okay, now how do I get out of this? Because I definitely screwed this one up. Um, but there's no other, there, there's really no other way. Like there, there's no, there is no certainty. Like there wasn't certainty before, even if you have all the data analysis and there was no certainty then, and there darn sure isn't any now. And I think for me, I sort of look at this pandemic as this weird test, right? Like I've been an entrepreneur now for six years. I have finally gotten comfortable with the idea of uncertainty and mm -hmm. it's like, oh really? Let's find out just how comfortable you are. Yeah. So it's weird. I, I kind of look at this time as this like level up, uh, you know, as an entrepreneur, it's like, okay, you've navigated a company for seven years without having to raise money. It's doing really well. Okay. You got this level. Now we're going to make it harder for you. See if you can do the same thing under these circumstances. And, and you know, hopefully you've chosen the right team. Hopefully you've created an environment where they can sort of be leaders when you can't and uh, come what may. This is really interesting, this, this point about team. And I actually think it's applicable even if you're not working in a, in a company, in a team, but actually like who you're building around you. Um, one of the things that we, we had to say really early on is like, man, if you have a day when you do not have the fire, just be like, I'll have the fire because somebody else on this team will and you can let them carry us forward. And what I've seen on my team is like, I've gotten out of the way a little bit. And now I see, you know, Clay Pruitt, our head of, uh, of acquisitions and programming, who just like took this idea of online festivals and was off to the races, like came up with the pledge. Um, you know, he and, and uh, Julie Haberstick, who works with him, they just like built a new universe and they built and basically like scoped and launched a new product. They worked with the product team on it. The product, like, I just didn't have to be, right. I, I wasn't involved and they just like ran with it. And thank God, because I was behind the scenes, like trying to figure out how to keep the, you know, the business alive. And I wouldn't have had the energy to spearhead that anyway. And so I do think thinking about like, if I may, who's your squad <laughs> that like, can I, you're welcome. Um, <laughs> who can like move the ball forward on the days when like, I can't. And how can you build that around you? Um, somebody uh, in our YouTube comments just uh, asked what I think is actually really important because this is another thing that came up a lot for people is they're looking for a break. Like what about the moment of stillness? How do you get space? uh when you need it because i was talking about this uh with someone like 
what my anxiety feels like is like, I can see that there's all this space, but I just don't feel like there's any space. So like, how do you find and make space right now when you need it? Uh, I can take a shot at that. I mean, I think I would just bounce off what Franklin said, which is when you empower, at least for me, when I empower my team to make decisions, uh, it frees me up to think more. And, you know, I, I really try to make very few decisions on sort of like a weekly basis. Uh, and I think it also teaches the team uh, that that's sort of like acceptable to say, hey, I'm not, you know, I'm not super excited about this. You seem really excited about this. Like, go go solve this problem. Like, you're normally the person building the solution, but like, why don't you actually like architect it as well? And like, send it to me. You know, I'm happy to sort of check it off, but I need a day, or I'm I'm working on this sort of other problem that helps me. It's also an ego thing. I think sometimes I feel like I can't do that, um, but sometimes like I don't know. Like when I've when I've said, hey, like I'm just gonna take a few days off, and then the company performs better than it. Like, it's hard to admit that sometimes that. That maybe you're not as necessary as you think you are, but but that's the also like the best feeling. It's the worst feeling in the world. It's the best feeling in the world. Like when you when your company can move forward without you and potentially make better decisions than you can. Yep. To me, that's the dream. You know, long long term, your ego sort of takes a hit. I think, but it's it's a it's a great and and then you can when you start doing that, you can you can you know you can do that more and more and more. Um, and the the other thing I would say is just like I've I've often had to sort of like reorient what people are working on often in sort of normal daily lives. Like you're, you're often doing things you might not enjoy because it's just part of what you're supposed to be doing. And so just really saying, Hey, like, what is everyone working on? Are you excited about that? If you're, you know, can we switch these two projects, you know, like just making people excited about what they're doing. I think, especially when you're in an office, it's, it's sort of easy to get excited because you're surrounded by people you love. And you're like, even if the work itself maybe is not that interesting, it's yeah. like fun to do it together. Um, it's like training, working out, all these sorts of things, right? And then you realize, at least I've realized, like when I'm at, when I'm at home uh, and I can't really sort of physically context switch, like there's a lot of work that I just like don't enjoy doing uh, that I have to do. Um, and I think it's great to be able to be like, hey, team, I actually hate doing this. Does anyone like doing this? And often the answer is yes. Like I would love to do this. And like I can't imagine like how, you know, they, they, they're excited about it because they're like, I, I would never be able to take take this responsibility in a different company. Um, and so sometimes it's just like being, you know, as you said about clarity, right? Just like letting people in, being transparent. I think you'll 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 sort of gain a lot from doing that. I think that's a applicable to an individual. I think it's applicable to an individual artist as well. It just takes there's more of a um, sort of a threshold that you you have to build for yourself, which is like who are you talking to? Who can you be transparent with? And who are you kind of inviting into your process? Um, cause I, I do want to think about how many of the folks who are listening are kind of, are still on their own are, are considered like working on their own and like yeah. how, how you build some of these things in, even in that circumstance. Yeah. Um, one, one of the other things that, uh, came up a lot is because our lives are lived so digitally right now. Um, well, actually, what I want to do first is, Sheena, you tweeted something yesterday or the day before about how nobody really believes you about how disconnected some folks really are in the United States. Can you talk to us a little bit about what you like? What are the stats behind that? Yeah. So three three areas that I think um, people often overlook overlook um, is Internet deserts, banking deserts and food deserts. So. All those three food deserts are places where there's not any like fresh food. There's not a supermarket. These are places that people are literally they live off food at the convenience store. So while a lot of us have the have the convenience of going to a convenience store just to grab snacks and get gas, there are people in America like that is all they have as far as when they walk in that store to get food. There is no supermarket to go get fresh food from. Um, so that is that's a food desert, a banking desert is a location or, or radius of an area where there is zero or maybe one bank. And usually if there is one bank, it's going to be a place, uh, it's gonna be a bank that um, is probably like a credit union or a community bank, a small bank that doesn't have the same technology advancement that you'll see in like a regional or, or a national bank. And the internet deserts are places um, 
it's simply people don't have access to internet. Uh, I think the last number that I saw was like 33 million people don't use or don't have access to the internet. And I think because we all use, we're on Wi-Fi all day long for the most part, we just think that everybody in the world is on the same page that we're on. And actually, that's not the case. So, um, ten percent. Yeah, it's. I mean, ten percent people don't use or don't have access to the internet, and it's something what? that we. What are they doing? And she dropped off. Um, she but it's more than ten percent. Uh, so what now? I was just making jokes. She's joined the ten percent. Uh, um, and it's, it's crazy because some it's. I think food data have become a. All three of them have become a big issue or a big deal now. Which, in my opinion, they've always been a big deal. Let me say they've come to the forefront with COVID nineteen. Um, food deserts because people already didn't have access to food, and then we you know people are trying to run out and get food and toilet paper. And people are now saying like, oh, we're trying to do food things. We're trying to get to people who already didn't have food anyway. So that's one thing. Internet deserts have become a big issue because a lot of the schools and education systems was at one time trying to say, we're going to do like these online learning or virtual learning. But then you have so many students who don't have internet access. Some of them not only they not have laptops, but they also don't have internet access. And usually when they have internet access, it's at the school or it's at the local library. But if they're both shut down, I don't have I don't have internet access. Um, so it's been a really big issue, even in ed tech or the education field, because not every student has internet access. And then banking deserts, which is more so even definitely my field, is the funniest thing. I say funny, but it's really not. But the funniest thing has been with the stimulus checks and the government uh, getting on TV and pretty much being like, well, one in four homes are unbanked, so we have to figure out how to get a check to people who can't get direct deposit. And it's kind of like, so how long have you been in federal government to just not realize that one in four homes in America didn't have bank accounts? Um, and even honestly, as a running a company that is BC backed, I can't tell you how many times investors have asked me, is there even a market big enough in America for people who are unbanked or underbanked? So people who live in, I, mean, I don't know if I'm living in a bubble, or if everybody else lives in a bubble for the most part. <laughs> um, but I mean, these are real life issues. And as you know, Emily, this is my second startup. Cafe is my second startup. It's not my first startup. And I spent a lot of time between Austin, but also a lot of time in Silicon Valley with my first startup. And when I left Silicon Valley for my second startup, you know, I, I always tell people, I love the Valley. A lot of our money comes from the Valley. There's a lot of innovation in the Valley. I would never take anything from it in that sense. However, their version of real world problems is not the rest of the, the world's version of real world problems. You know, driving a car by itself or buying a drone to drop or Amazon packed off of my front door, there's people who are starving and they can't, you know, somebody just mentioned Cash App. I mean, it's, it, that was actually interesting because you see a lot of people who was giving out donations. It's like, well, drop your Cash App name or your PayPal name. And then it's like, okay, well, what about the 33 million people who don't have any of that because their cash apps connect to a card or PayPal connect to a bank account? Not everybody has access to that. So um, those are three things I think that COVID-19 has really brought to the forefront that it was one, I'll say this, there was one quote I read, uh, which is very true. And the quote said, everybody in America thinks they're middle class until they lose their job. And I think that this whole pandemic has made people realize that, okay, maybe we're just not off as the great Americans as we as we thought, you know, we once were. Um, and I mean, I'm, I'm an American, I love to be, I love that I'm American, I love, you know, I love this country. But I think that without question, there's been some flaws that have really been put on the forefront um, that has been brought to the forefront of this pandemic for sure. So I want to ask a question about this because I, like all of our work is really rooted in uh, giving resource and access to those who may not have had it. And if you really get to the edges of our work, we would be successful when the those 33 million people also have access to it. But 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 right now, 
absent the public libraries that give you internet access, absent the bank account that allows you to even receive stimulus or help or donations or whatever it takes, absent those things, you know, this is a small example, but like I was talking to the director of a, of a Pan-Asian film festival who was saying most of the folks that we reach are so old, <laughs> they're not participating online for another set of reasons, which is just like they've sort of been left behind by technology and we rely on the places they gather in person to reach them with the culture that gives them purpose. So right now and looking ahead, how do we like, what are, what are we gonna do, you guys, when we can't reach the people that we're most hoping to be able to reach? What, what, are, the, what are the things that are gonna help us address this? I mean, I mean, I think about it even from, if we were to label like even baby boomers, when I think of film, as you mentioned, like I know a lot of older couples where like their thing is going to the movies together. Like they don't wanna watch Netflix. They don't wanna watch Hulu. Like I want to take, me and my husband who's been married for 40 years and I want to walk into a movie theater and I want to watch a film. Um, and it's just not, I, and I do think something that, that will change the think with companies like mine, like Capway, I think that banking deserts um, because of mobile banking will start to make a change. Um, but the internet access, food deserts, a lot of this stuff is honestly just by design. And until we see um, money going into different cultures, um, are people stepping up in different ways? That's not going to change anytime soon. So one of the most interesting responses to the, if you could be really brave, uh, what might you admit won't exist anymore was upholding structures of harm. And you just mentioned a structure that is by design, that is a structure of harm. And I'm, I'm really curious to get your all of your take on that. Like, do you think there is an opportunity here or even a probability that we are in for a structural shift that could go the direction that we all want it to go? I mean, I think it's possible, but I also think it was possible that that could have happened prior to this moment and it didn't. And I think that the people who, uh, have been able to sustain control on power uh see as an see this moment as an opportunity to seize it even more tightly uh and with even greater control in much the same way that those of us who want to see it as an opportunity for change see it as an opportunity for change so look i i Depending on the day, I'm an optimistic pessimist or pessimistic optimist. Like I, I, I believe that there are things that are possible, but I don't trust people to implement those possibilities. And I have, we've seen enough moments of crisis uh, taken advantage of by traditional structures of power to further ingrain those structures of, structures of power that I have no faith that this moment will deliver us from those structures of power without all of us doing the work to make sure that they are. And I think that we will face great opposition in doing that. And I think that it will be made more difficult by the changes in society that are necessary and inevitable as a consequence of this moment. I want to add on to what Franklin said is I, I like the way you said that. I'm an optimistic pessimist on some days and a pessimistic optimist on other days. I think that this moment has um, actually shown some of the urgency to some of the issues that we've had. I saw this really, you know, interesting tweet. Someone said, you know, the COVID virus did not destroy America. It revealed what was already broken. Yeah, that's exactly right. Um, and I think that you know, with the next wave of leaders who are lawmakers in Congress, I feel a little bit more optimistic um, that they have our best interests, you know, at heart and that they are they can relate a lot more to some of the structural things that they've seen, you know, over the course of their lives. The one thing, um, and it's, it's really tough too, I read this, this, really, this article on Gen Z's who were born in like 2000, they were born into 9-11, they, they, the first news cycle they remember was the financial crisis. They had Ebola and now COVID. So they've just been kind of born into this generation of trauma. Um, and I think that 
as, as young lawmakers uh, continue to fill the ranks, that I'm a little bit, I've, I've become increasingly optimistic. But the one thing I also wanted to add to Emily is something on um, what Sahil was saying earlier on how to create space. Um, because I just, I want to make the distinction that we are not working from home. We are working at home during a global pandemic. Those are two very different things. And I think that, you know, there's been a lot of pressure that we put on ourselves, quite frankly. You know, the, these tweets about, oh, Shakespeare wrote his best works while quarantined or Newton created calculus while he was quarantined. So yeah. you better write that book. You better do that thing, that thing that you said you weren't gonna do. And I think that it's all quite frankly, like it's BS and we have to hold ourselves, you know, to a standard of having compassion for ourselves. Like we have to give ourselves space first. And I think that a lot of us are like, okay, now I'm at home. I have, you know, four more hours because I'm not commuting and doing these other things. And it is so important that we, that we address our inner self and commit to that. Because if we don't do that, our businesses won't survive. And we won't have that gut to make the brave decisions that we need to make. Um, and so I just, I really wanted to just like to, to add that really quickly because I, I think it's, it's really important. Oh, y'all haven't ridden King Lear yet? <laughs> that asshole was quarantined away from his wife and kids. I don't want to hear it. Is that, <laughs> as, that is a relevant detail for sure. I mean, uh, I, it matters. I just think that, that the whole hustle culture, and that's part of it, is just absurd and, sort of, and frankly sort of laughable. But I think especially at this time, I mean, I, I told my team point blank, like, tell me if there's something you can't or don't want to do right now, we will figure it out. Because and by the way, I'll go back to being you know a, a hard ass after this is all over. But right now, let's just get through this. And 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 what I tell a lot of writers is like, look, I know that there's this instinct to want to write the great American novel, the great screenplay right now. Your job as an artist is to survive this moment because simply in survival, it will inform everything you write after this. And so, so get through it however you need to, and then tell us about that experience when you have the mental capacity to actually focus on creation. Because if you, if you do in this moment, good for you. But when I ask the question to sort of my community on Twitter, what do writers most need right now? The answer overwhelmingly, other than childcare, was focus. So if you can't focus to sit down and write King Lear, you are not alone. In fact, you're probably more normal than you realize. Um. Jenny Waldo um, chimed in on YouTube, something that I don't want to miss, which is that, you know, she feels this pressure to pivot, to make a bold move and position herself for her project, or it feels like she'll miss the train. And girl, I feel that hard um, in part because like whatever that train is, I hope is the one that makes sure that me and my team continue to like put food on the table. Um, I don't want to miss that train, whatever that is. Um, and because we have been trained in opportunity. Like we've been trained to be opportunistic. We've been trained in the culture of productivity and that our value is tied to our output. And that is the thing that has given us purpose. That is all the structure that is crumbling right now. Because what's clear is if we only associate value, like monetary value with output, nothing works in a crisis. We, we've not built a system that can respond to a crisis at all. In fact, the more efficiently you build the system, the more vulnerable it is to crisis, right? The less flexible it is. Um, and so I've been trying to think about it in terms of like softness or flexibility. And one of the things I said to my team was, please work less mm -hmm. um, because the energy that just to survive this uh, is, is energy that you would have normally been spending on your work and, uh, and maybe you never needed to be spending that energy on your work in the first place, right? So like, please work less and do what uh, what you need to do to take care of yourself. Um, because I feel like uh, everything changed except the internet. And the internet was still like, do business at my pace, bitches. And we're like, what? Like, how can we possibly keep up um, with the like growth at all costs mentality. Yeah, the same 24 hours as Beyonce. 
No, Beyonce has 45 people who help her with things. So <laughs> five hours that I do not have because I am cleaning my toilets and I'm cutting my family's hair now. And I'm like, like when you all of a sudden become the hairdresser, the housekeeper, the three meal chef, um, and you know, just trying to get my kids to eat is an hour. Um, like all of these things, we've become all of these other things that, that we used to have the luxury to offload. Um, and I just think it means we have to work less and that actually the right way perhaps to approach economics, like our economic structure at all is one in which we're working less and we have more time to just do our life things, that it's not about specialization. Like we've become so specialized and that's not helping us right now. Well, I, I think it's also important to remember that like the tra a train is not your only uh, means of transportation to your destination. So sure, you, you may miss the train. Guess what? There are other trains arriving that are headed that way. You can walk, it may take longer, but you'll get stronger in the process and your endurance will be better. Like you may figure something out while you're waiting on the platform that may allow you to, to rent a private plane to get you there fa faster. Just because you miss one train doesn't mean you've missed out on the destination or the opportunity to take a journey in that destination. And frankly, and I think Oh, God. Oh, no, 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 no. I was gonna say, adding to that too, every decision that we make is a learning opportunity. So if we hop on that train or we hop on an airline or we hop in our homegirl's car, whatever it is, like there's an opportunity, there's an opportunity to learn. And when I reframed all my decisions around like I'm gonna learn the most I can from it and I'm gonna make sure to digest those learnings, they became a lot less stressful. Yeah, that's a really good point. It's yeah, hard to say too, I think the train that is gonna take you to the destination, you probably see a lot of those, like, oh, this is the chance, this is the right. candidate, this is the business, this is the project. But if you look at the people who found those things, it's often like not the thing that they thought it was gonna be, it was like the thing that they accidentally got on to get to another train, but then they 100%. couldn't that train and then they actually were on the better train anyways this whole time. 100%, yeah. So, and if you look closely yeah. at that first train, you realize that it like veers off to another direction in the distance and it's actually like an abattoir at the end. It's not- There's only really white people on it. Yeah, always, always a bad, always a bad sign. I was gonna <laughs> say, it's, it's actually that, what is, oh God, what is that ice train? The, it's actually so sure, yeah. and well, like well see if it's designed by Bong Joon Ho I can get with it. <laughs> <laughs> like if I'm just being entirely real. Um there is a there is one last question I think this is actually an interesting place to land. Um as business owners what impact do you feel like you are uniquely able to tackle during this pandemic as leaders? What was I the mean, question? Yeah, yeah, can, you, can you repeat it real quick? So what impact do you feel like you're uniquely able to have as leaders during the pandemic? As leaders specifically? Um, well, if I have as a leader, especially of my team, I would say I've actually gotten closer to my team um, in this time. And I actually tell my team that work comes forth. I know that, and I, I know that sounds probably super crazy right now, um, but I tell my, my team that work comes forth. I tell them that their mental health is first. Yeah. The emotional health is second. And then their physical health is third. And then we can worry about work after that. Because if, if none of those, the first three aren't in place, it not, work isn't going to really matter anyways. But I, I do think I've gotten really much closer to my team um, just, just as a whole. And then as a leader in the space, um, I think that for me, it's, I've been able to definitely voice, have, use my voice more when people are very much open to listening now. Um, mm -hmm. That is at the kind of forefront of, of some of the major issues that's going on with this pandemic. So that would be my answer. I think that my job and what I'm really passionate about is the way that we use technology to connect productively. Because we, I mean, we can connect with people on social media all the time, but are we forging those you know, genuine relationships. And I've been really excited to kind of delve a bit deeper into that because I think, like I said, I think there are gonna be some long-term impacts on the way that we are connecting with others post-pandemic. Um, but I would say also, I've become a bit more uh, riskier. Like, and I don't, like, sometimes I'll gut check some of my decisions with my board and other times I just go do it. Um, and I feel like I've, I've had, I've just not, it's not the confidence. I've just made a commitment that 
you know, Silicon Valley hasn't really gotten the arena of connection right from a technology perspective. And so I'm like, well, why am I listening to, <laughs> why am I going to their opinion, you know? And so I'm just like, I'm just gonna lead on. And like, you know, everything's have to be done a little bit differently. So I've taken the opportunity to do that. And also with, with my team, I, you know, I think that just allowing people to work differently right? You know, hey, I'm going to go walk the dog and I'm going on a two hour walk in the middle of the day. Go do that. You know, I, I go to my Peloton, I bike at 10 o'clock every morning after meetings and people know that like I'm off biking. And so I think that, you know, just adapting my leadership style to one that is more empathetic and one that is more compassionate mm -hmm. as opposed to, I think Shani, you raised a really good point because if those other things aren't right, which a lot of people are suffering right now, you know, work is not gonna be as productive. And so I think that I've flexed up my leadership style, but I've also taken an opportunity to to lead and not feel, you know, insecure that I wasn't from the, you know, Silicon Valley kind of inner circle, um, this really important issue. Yeah. So Hale, how about you? You always have something really smart to say on Twitter. I know that's like part of your, yeah. part of your brand. I'm more on Twitter than I am at speaking. Uh, <laughs> I would say, I mean, being able to show people like I love Gumroad, I love this business that I started, but it's not everything. Like it, it, I care more about the problem we're trying to solve than the business we're using to solve it. And so, I don't think Gumroad is going to go away. But if it somehow did, if it, you know, I, you know, you can start a new co companies or whatever. Who cares, right? They're just made up entities that allow you to sort of group people together and pay taxes to the government or whatever, whatever reason they exist for. I don't even know, but. They're just a thing, you know, there's this made up concept. And so I think the humans are the important people, right? The, the people on the team, our users, those all human beings. Uh, and so I think, I don't know, it's like, it's good to show people. I think there are people on the team that are like, I need to work super hard right now. There's all these people that need us. And, and I'm like, yes, that's that's true. But like, just don't, work, you know, like that it's, these people will need us tomorrow. They're, you know, like these people are gonna be around. And I don't know, I think, it, especially when I talk to other business owners, you know, uh, it's just like, look, like, just you matter, your people matter, your the people that you care about matter, your community matters. But like the social media platforms we use, the businesses we use, like those can go and come back and go and come back. And they have for a long period of time. You know, the country might go and, you know, I don't, I don't know who knows like what's going to what the world's going to look like. Uh, uh, I would say the other thing is that just like showing people it takes time. Like Gumroad is a nine year old company. And so I just try to show people like, look, we might be doing great now, but you can look at our trajectory and like, seven years in we were considered a failure you know and so like these things take a lot of time uh and you know just like that train right it's just like i think people there's a sense of urgency and especially you don't need to read the news every day look i can tell you what the news is going to be like just you don't need to react to that i don't know just lower the stakes for yourself i guess you know like you're going to be making movies writing scripts for the rest of your life hopefully like it's not something you have to figure out and, and succeed at tomorrow and every time you you know you know every time you try you're making some progress that's all right every time you try you're making some progress that's the t-shirt there you go <laughs> franklin how about you yeah i mean like i said i'm sort of in this weird situation that because my company does the one thing that everybody can do uh some amount of leadership has sort of been foisted on me whether i want it or not during this period so very early on even before there was an official lockdown i started getting incoming phone calls from folks who were not in the habit of calling me uh, and saying, hey, I have a client who has COVID-19 and they're looking for some stuff to read and you have a reputation for good taste. What should I send them? And those incoming calls have accelerated rather rapidly over the last few weeks. And so a lot of my time and my team's time is sort of spent putting together these care packages for A-list actors and directors. Um, and that's given us the ability to put a lot of writing talent that isn't even represented by an agent in front of A-list actors and directors. Um, you know, similarly, I can have those conversations on social media and talk about what's important and where people should be looking for writers and writing, uh, which was already sort of just how I behaved anyway. It's just that now there are more eyeballs on me because it's not like you can be out making a movie right now. Yeah. Um, and then I think, as everybody's already said, like as a an entrepreneur, as a business, as a manager who feels responsible for his team, and wants to make sure that the people who allow the thing to keep existing, that they can keep existing, not for the purpose of the business, but because at a minimum, I owe them 
providing them a sustainable path in life, yeah. whether they're working with or for me or not. And I think that's been more of a focus to me, how effective I've been at that. You would have to talk to them. Um, but I hope I've been doing a good job in that regard. Uh, and then I think lastly, like, um, you know, I, I think on some fundamental level, I think I'm in a sort of similar situation that Isa is, which is all of a sudden I'm like, oh, so y'all don't understand what's going on right now either? So it's all like we're all on the same level. We're all in a new playing field. Your 20 years or 30 years of experience might not even be an advantage. They may be a disadvantage now. And I've been doing this for long enough that I think I'm entitled to have an opinion about how things might move forward from here. So I'm taking shots now that I never would have contemplated taking a month and a half ago. I'm yep. telling people that they're wrong that I never would have said that to six weeks ago. Yep. Now, whether again, whether that will work, how that will be received by some of those people remains to be seen. But I think that I am sort of, I think in many ways this moment has liberated me to, to, to behave in the way that I've, I've always wanted to behave, but frankly, never necessarily had the courage to. Yeah. Because to quote our president, what do you got to lose, right? And unlike drinking bleach or being black and voting for Donald Trump, you don't have anything to lose by actually living your perspective on the world. Yeah. Um, and there's actually a great deal of upside to be potentially had because I suspect that all of us to do what we do have had to be twice as good to get half as far. So take the hinges off the door. We're probably blowing the entire door up. Yeah. And this is why it was called making brave decisions, because I think this is a moment where um, giving a lot of fucks is not really going to be rewarded uh -uh. Um, because the people whose opinions are giving a lot of fucks about know just as little as you do about how this is all going to go. And, the, I think the people who are making brave decisions now are likelier to shape what that future looks like uh, than the ones who are hanging back and hibernating until we go back to normal. Right. Um, and I do think this is a time to make those phone calls. And I'm, I'm getting on the phone definitely with people who didn't have a lot of time for me before mm -hmm. because, oh yeah, you're the person that has new ideas. You know, oh yeah, you you are sort of known as an innovator, and before I didn't have to think about you, but now what if you know something I don't, right? Um, and so I think that's like it's kind of an amazing place to land, Franklin. Thank you for that. I like the having the courage to be yourself and your fully expressed self in all your ideas. Um, I think is I think we're in a time where you're likelier to be rewarded for that than ever before, um, and and likelier to shape the future. I can't thank you guys enough. Um, like, I feel so honored that you said yes to this. And I'm sorry that I, I did this to you publicly. I just tweeted at you and made everybody else tell you that we had to do this. Um, and now you've just shown me that that's a good tactic. So uh, <laughs> probably I'll be hitting you up again. Um, Sheena, Isa, Sahil, Franklin, you're the best. Um, it's been ticking on below where you can keep up with us. Um, and Seed and Spark is doing a ton of events moving forward along this front. And I think we'll be having more conversations like this. Um, so make sure you uh, follow all of these incredible folks. And thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye.